Peter. Good morning. It is great to see you today. All right, we, uh, we need room for two, all right? Right over there, right over there, all right? Great, thank you guys. Hey, good to see you all today. In fact, it's great to be back. I've been gone for a couple of weeks. You probably never noticed, right? Uh, but it's good to be back. Nothing is broken and nothing is bruised, all right? Uh, if you are visiting with us today, it's your first time here. I've been off on a 10-day a, a vacation, went uh, rafting down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon for seven days. It was awesome. It was terrific. Uh, Terry, Terry's here. He survived it. All right. John, one of our earlier services, uh, six men in a van. We were known by the rest of the group as the man van. All right. Man van. And uh, we, we survived. We have a lot of good food, and we have some wonderful experiences to share. But if you are a guest today, thanks for being here. You'll hear this again on the announcement video, but let me do it now. I'll give you a little more time. There's a communication card that's due in front of you. If you would fill it out, drop it in the offering bag when it comes by a little later in the service. Next week, we will not knock on your door. We will not bother you on the phone, but through the mail, we'll send you information that tells you about the church, about our staff, about what we believe, hopefully answer most of your questions. And uh, we promise we're not going to sell it to anybody or use it in any other way, but just to send you that information. And so we'd love for you to do that now. Those cards are also for our church family. If you have messages to our staff, prayer requests, updates, Please use those cards for that. Every Tuesday morning, our staff meets. We go through those cards. We pray for the requests. And then we uh, attend to the other needs or requests that are on there. So please take the opportunity to take advantage of that. Many of you have said, Tim, are we going to get to know anything about your trip? We're going to get... We've got about five pictures today. We, we may do some of them. We may put together a nice video down the road. We're still collecting pictures from others, uh, new friends that we met from New Jersey, from Canada, from Washington State, uh, St. Louis, I think, Missouri, we're on the trip. So we're all collecting pictures and exchanging videos. But uh, uh, we've got a few to pop up with you today. So we'll show you a couple here real quick. Oh, look at that one. Yeah, that was, uh, that's our wrap. Uh, you got those pictures there? Yeah. Okay, all right. Th now, now that's kind of called a riffle. That, that, okay, that's not a bad, that, that, that might be slightly more than a riffle there, but uh, that's our boat. The other team is watching this come through the rapids. Uh, next one. Okay, now, see the bearded guy on the front? Yeah. Okay, that is John Longstaff's younger brother, Jim. He's a retired senior medical officer out of the Navy, currently works for a hospital two days a week. He and I were in junior high and high school together. I'm sitting right behind him. <laughs> you can see my hat. Hey, I'm, you know what? If you're going to be on this thing, sit right by the doctor, okay? I sat out front the first day and I realized I was a good second chair guy. Uh, the, the guy in red up top, that is, uh, that's John Longstaff from our church, and to his left, to your right, that is Terry Orr, who's sitting right there. He, now, those guys, they're sitting on the deck, okay? Those guys sitting up higher, that's called the deck. That, uh, that raft bends at the deck, okay? Shh. Terry, I'm telling the truth, am I not? There are times that those of us on the uh, rubber were looking down at those sitting on the deck, okay? Uh, uh, that, that's not a bad rapid right there. That's just a cooling off one. All right, next. There's some of the wildlife we saw. Saw a lot of mountain uh, mountain sheep, all right, down along the river uh, bed there, eating and, and getting drinks and resting. Uh, we made that one nervous, so we ran away. Here we are going through another light rapid. And uh, there we are, getting ready for a bigger rapid. Next. There's a, that wave right there you're looking at, that's about a six to eight foot wave, okay? Doesn't look that bad for you. What you have to realize is from where we put in in Marble Canyon, we go down. The river keeps going deeper and lower, so we're not at the same elevation. It's go, there are times that um, you can't see the waves you're getting ready to go into because they are lower than where you are on the river. There are times the raft ahead of us, we lost sight of them. They would drop into a hole, all right? That told us we were heading for the hole, okay? It's kind of like, you know, you see somebody heading off to hell, don't follow them, all right? Don't follow them. And yet we follow them. 
There were times we were told the waves when you dropped into the hole that the wave was 18 to 20 feet above you. You got wet then. You really got wet. All right. Now, uh, okay, so you can't hardly see us there. All right, that's good. We're down. Uh, all right, next. That's Drew. It. That's it. That's it. Okay, so just a small taste of what we went through. Uh, but it was great fun. It was probably 105 degree temperature, but the water was 48 degrees. So really, we did not suffer from heat. What we found out two days after we got home, uh, a guy from New Jersey uh, sent us a picture of Havasu Falls where we were, where the water is beautifully blue. It's, it's, it's an unbelievable blue there that feeds into the Colorado River. We hiked up to it, got to enjoy it. Uh, it was beautiful. Two days later, the day after they pulled us out, okay, and our trip was over, they had a huge flash flood. And they showed us the before and the after picture. The picture when we were there, or two days later, it was just a mud uh, falls. All right, and they had to evacuate all the rafters out of the canyon because of that big flash flood. I knew nothing about it. We were already gone and out. All right, uh, it was wonderful. So uh, anyway, that's uh, that's the trip. We won't talk any more about that. Let me direct your attention to the screen and to our morning announcements. If you're a guest with us this morning, we're glad that you're here. Please feel free to fill out the connect card in front of you and we'll contact you during the week with things that happen around this campus, not just here on Sunday mornings, but all through the week. Our vision statement here at New Hope is to compellingly communicate the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Here are just some of the activities that we hope to achieve just that. Greetings from Uganda. Hey everybody, we're looking forward to seeing you August 5th. We'll be with you during all of the services. And what else are we going to do? Well, we're doing something a little different this year. We're calling it the Village Encounter. Well, tell me more. Well, have you ever wanted to see what it's like to live in Africa? Definitely. I want to know what it's like to cook like an African or carry water on my hand, all of those things. I bet you guys are wondering what it's like also. Well, we're going to give you an opportunity to do just that. So come on out. You can come just by yourself or bring the whole family. And we're going to have starting times at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 4 o'clock. All the ending at 5 o'clock for evening church service. And some of the activities that we're going to have, shall we, are what? Well, there's going to be different stations that you can walk through. Uh, very educational, find out a little bit more about life here in Uganda. Mm -hmm. um, we're also going to have a village market. Ooh, shop shopping. Shopping. I That's know a lot of you are now coming who weren't coming before. That's right. This will give you an opportunity to... Um, Purchase some of the products that our girls have been busy making at New Life Skills Center. What are you going to do with the kids to keep them busy while they go for shopping? Well, we're going to have ice cream, ice cream social. So come in out and make yourself a Sunday. We look forward to seeing you. That's August 5th. And uh, we're excited to see all of you again and catch up a bit. So we'll see you guys soon. Man, I can't wait for August 5th. That's going to be awesome. So remember, August 5th, the Village Encounter here at New Hope, our very own missionaries, Matt and Shelly Actis, are going to be joining us. Uh, they're also going to be taking over the Sunday night service. So if you want more Actises, come to the Sunday night service on that night. We'll see you there. Good morning, Pride Packers. That's you that are 55 years and older. We're looking forward to having you sign up today for our Prime Packers luncheon. It's provided this week. Tuesday, we're going to be meeting from noon to 2. There's about 85 spots available, only 20 are left. So we need you to sign up on the sheet that's going around today and uh, join us Tuesday. We're going to be writing letters to active military folks that are associated with our congregation. So we're looking forward to having lunch. You don't have to bring anything. We're having pizza and cookies. We're looking forward to seeing you there and writing letters for our active military. August 26th. Here in New Hope is going to be Baptism Sunday. If you're interested in getting baptized and declaring that Jesus is sufficient in your life, make sure you grab a connect card, fill out the information, write baptism on the back, or shoot an email to office at newhopechurch.net. We would love to see you get baptized on that day. 
Good morning. Yeah, I just want to remind you to uh, be a part of the Widow's Lunch Bunch. If you're part of that group, look in the bulletin. Give some details as to where. As uh, you send me Falls uh, restaurant. And it's at 1230 this afternoon. Call in our first service. Well, we've had a really exciting week here at Newport this week. It was Vacation Bible School. And the Mr. J Band was here, and they were teaching the kids Bible story, playing games, playing a lot of music. Kids had a great time. 150 registered kids were here on the campus. We want to thank you so much for all of your support in the past week, your donations of items for BBS, as well as food contributions for the band, those who have hosted the band members in their homes, and um, all of the volunteers that were here this week. We couldn't have done it without you, but we are so very grateful. We just appreciate everything that you do. Thank you for blessing us as a church so that we can bless kids in our community. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad that you're here. Today, we hope that Jesus Christ is sufficient for you. How many of you were here at any night during Vacation Bible School this week? Raise your hand. Were they not awesome? I got back uh, in time to be here on Thursday for the entire Thursday evening for the opening ceremony, the teaching lesson to the uh, pre-K through the third graders, and then for the fourth through sixth graders, uh, and then for the closing ceremony. Uh, let me tell you what I noticed, just my one night here. First off, I saw more parents come and stay for opening ceremony than I ever had before. Normally after the first night, parents drop their kids off, kick them out of the car, take off, don't come back until it's all over. But parents came in, sat all in the back for the opening ceremony, didn't leave until that was over. Some of them stayed for their kids' portion of it in here. And then most of the parents, when they came to pick up their kids, they came early enough to be here for the closing ceremony. And so it was just absolutely terrific. I saw parents I've never seen before. I've met kids I've never met before. Uh, Mr. J just knocked it out of the park. As he talked about that big chair that Mark and Jennifer were standing in front of that was right over there, that was a throne. And the message to the kids was, who's sitting on your throne? Do you need to step off the throne and let someone else sit in your place? And uh, to listen to these kids sing, especially the younger kids, all by themselves, without Mr. J singing with them, knowing all those words, listening to them recite the four biblical principles that he taught all week, and then watching some of those kids at the closing session give their life to Jesus Christ was absolutely powerful. 150 plus kids were here this past week, so it was incredible. So, thank you for all of you. Uh, Mark and Jennifer are now gone. <laughs> After BBS, they're gone. Uh, their whole family is actually boarding the plane this morning uh, in San Francisco, heading to England. As many of you know, Mark is uh, a born and bred Englishman, and uh, his parents still live there. His mom has the early onset of dementia, and so he wants to get there to see her. His uh, sister called him a few months ago, letting him know uh, kind of how rapidly things were progressing for her. The other challenge that Mark is, uh, is hoping that God gives him a wide open door is to share faith in Christ with his parents. His parents are, are outspoken atheists. He was raised in that environment. He said, my parents made a big mistake. They sent me to private school run by the Episcopal Church. <laughs> so uh, they, they thought it was cool to send their kid to a private school, did not realize that would be an introduction to their son, that there is a God, uh, there is this Bible that needs to be explored that tells us about Jesus. And once he came to the States, became a citizen, married Jennifer, and... Uh, moved in not far from here, and he said, one day I realized I need to find out more about God. And that's how they ended up at New World Church. The second Sunday here, Mark gave his life to Jesus Christ. Now he's our associate pastor. So, he's looking forward to the opportunity of being able to share his faith with his parents. So just be praying with them during these next 10 days or so for those open doors that, that, that might be provided for them. The Actus family, I just want to emphasize that a little bit. That is, for those of you who may be new to our church, the Actuses are from New Hope Church. They've been missionaries for four years in the country of Colombia. They planted a church that still is going today. After their four years in Colombia, they really felt a distinct call from God to change countries, change languages. And they have gone to the country of Uganda. They've been there two years now. They're coming home for a brief furlough. And uh, they're going to be back in their home church with us in August. And so we're excited about their presence that day. 
Uh, they'll be sharing in all the morning services. You heard about the village encounter during the afternoon, and then uh, the Sunday evening service. And so it'll be great to have them home. Sign up sheets that are coming around, the women's Bible study starting uh, the first Tuesday uh, of August, which is August the 1st, led by Tina Brown. They're going to be studying the book of Ephesians. That's on a Tuesday morning. If you're going to be a part of that, would you please sign up so that they have enough material when you arrive. The other sign-up sheet is going around. It's just a single board, so when it gets to the back, it needs to cross over and end up at the front. Uh, this is for Tuesday Senior Luncheon. Uh, this is your second kind of special Senior Luncheon in a row. Last month was the Carnival. Uh, huge, huge attendance that. This one, it was supposed to have been last Tuesday, but because of VBS, we had to postpone it a week since this is 4th of July, our nation's birthday. Uh, we're going to do something patriotic at Senior Luncheon. Uh, so we'd love for you to come. We have a, a family in our church whose son attended the church here as well before he enlisted in the military. And now he's serving uh, overseas. And we're going to be writing letters, all right, 250 letters to his troop. And so you come and join lunch that day. We're going to have all the materials here for you just to send a word of greeting and our prayers and our thoughts to the soldiers uh, in that particular troop. If you have not signed up already, uh, we need you to sign up. We have room for 85, and uh, I think we have 65 already signed up. So if you can come this Tuesday, it's going to be from uh, noon to 2. While you're writing those letters, you're going to be watching a an old movie, all right, uh, that I think you'll find enjoyable, as well as free food, all right, and uh, wonderful guests to visit with. Um, I have sitting up here by, on my pew this booklet. It's called The King Has Lost His Rhyme. This is from the BBS lesson this past week. What's in here, towards the back, at page number 10, how many of you recognize this with your kids or grandkids bringing it home this week? How many got hands going up? Okay. Um, if your kids brought this home, do this with them. Okay? They're supposed to do it with a wrinkled person. <laughs> That's pretty much everybody in this room. All right? I'm sorry. All of us have a little, you know, wrinkled here or there. I don't care how old you are, young you are. But they're supposed to do it with an older person. All right? Parent, or grandparent, or older sibling. Uh, they start, this is 21 days, it takes about 5 to 10 minutes to do it. You read a psalm, and it tells you which psalm to read. Day 1 is Psalm 1. Write the words of your favorite verse in the spot provided. Then write a prayer about that verse in your own words. That's it. All right? And you do that for 21 days. His challenge to our kids was create good habits. In 21 days, this ought to become a habit that you'll do on a continual basis. So, uh, I asked Mark and them after I heard all about that, I said, hey, could you guys run off a few more? I probably have 50 up here. Because you know what? What's good for the kids? It's good for you wrinkled folks. If you don't have a kid, come up here and pick one of these up. Turn to page 10 for the next 21 days. Go along with about 100 of our kids and do 21 days of a devotional and a prayer time. Taking 10 minutes out of your schedule to do that. So come pick one up, all right? They're free of charge. Here's the deal. You finish that? There's a little thing in the back that you can fill out, send it to Mr. J, and he'll send you his CD of music. Okay? If you do it with somebody else, two of you do it, he'll send you two CDs, all right, of his music that you can give to your kids or your grandkids or some neighbor kids because they love his music. All right? So come on up and pick one of those up. I encourage you to do that. Let me wrap up with prayer requests. And uh, it's always this way when I'm gone. It takes me longer to get caught up with things. But uh, there have been a lot of folks graduating to heaven over this past week. And so there's some folks I want you to be praying for. Rhonda, Davis, Natasha Gray, uh, they've been connected to our church for about 12 to 14 years. Uh, sometimes consistently, sometimes not. But Rhonda's son, Bill, and Tasha's brother, Bill Harris, uh, he died very unexpectedly at 42 years of age this past week. That service will be tomorrow, so we'll be praying for us as we share it. Uh, in 2011, I had the privilege of marrying Jeremy and Jessa Herman, uh, both local local young people. Uh, they moved to Huntington Beach, been there for several years, came back just recently. He had a new job in the area. 
uh, in his job. He got involved in an automobile accident. He was in the hospital for a couple of weeks. He was released for home. A week later, released by his doctor. And a week after that, released by the workman comp doctor to go back to work. His first day back to work, when a call went out for him, uh, he didn't respond. They went to look for him. Uh, they found him dead at his desk. Uh, don't know what the complications are. 41 years old. So what do we train for Jessa? Uh, and that service is going to be this coming Saturday. So please be praying for her. Uh, many of you know we've been praying for Charlie Dooms. Uh, that's Bernice Osborne's daughter. She's battled leukemia. Uh, had some good progress with treatment at Stanford. Found out just before I left, they, they, they saw the cancer coming back. She was going to be heading back to Stanford for some follow-up to see what the next steps would be. She ended up in the hospital and she passed away. And her service is going to be this Friday here at New Hope at 11 o'clock. Uh, thank you for those of you who've already volunteered to be of help in that service that day. And uh, Charlie was 71 years old. Uh, we have services this coming week, also for Ellen Williams and Don uh, Springstead, 75 and 88. Uh, from our small group, Elaine <coughs> Garrett Pratt is going to be going in for a heart procedure tomorrow that could end up, uh, it starts as a procedure, but it could end up with open heart surgery, all right, depending on all that they find or discover. So please be praying for Elaine as she waits for that, and then as she goes through that process tomorrow. Shelly Parker, who sings in our worship team many times, her husband, uh, they are up in the state of Washington. Greg's 38-year-old son is on life support. Uh, there is some improvement with him today, uh, but they continue to need your prayers. One of our high school girls, Kaylee, uh, her mom passed away unexpectedly last week. Uh, services are still pending there, but we would appreciate your prayers for Kaylee. And then we just received uh, the message night before last that uh, one of my dad's cousins down at Brothers, 93 years old, uh, was to be with the Lord uh, on Friday. So those services will be Thursday down at Brothers. So those are uh, a few updates of a few folks uh, and what's going on in their world. Brandy Walker got news that the cancer that was in her eye has been treated on remission for about two years is back. We don't know what that looks like at this point, but um, the family requested prayer for her today. So those are some of the updates. Uh, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. And would you join with me as we pray? <clears throat> our Father, it's great to be back home. It's great to be with a church family that I love to spend time with friends that I enjoy hanging out with, my own personal family that uh, I love so very, very much. Thank you for the privilege of the getaway, but also, Father, thank you for the privilege of coming home. And Lord, just as we enjoy coming home, I hope those of us who, by faith, have invited your Son, the Lord Jesus, to come live within our lives. I trust, Father, that we, in a growing measure, have that same kind of expectancy and desire to come home to be with you. Not that we want to rush it, that we're going to do anything to, to, to rapidly speed up that moment for that appointment, but Father, I hope that we realize that just as we believe that our sins can be forgiven and that someday when we die, we have a home in heaven, that David records for us these words, when I walk through the valley of the shadows of death. I will fear no And I pray that the time we've spent in recent months looking at the subject of heaven, that uh, we're realizing what a glorious place that we're going to. And Father, we have great expectations. Father, I'm so grateful to see Trish Sanchez in service with us today. For a few months, we have been praying for her. It is great to see her up and out. It's great to see her out of the hospital. It's great to see her functional, knowing how long that, uh, that, that Father, she was uh, not aware of anything. And the devastation of the stroke. I'm so grateful for her recovery. It's good to see her and Joe today. We just continue to trust you for your best in her life and progress. Dear Lord, for those who uh, have already got dates for services, those who are still planning services for loved ones who stepped out of our time and into your presence. 
We pray for your care and your comfort. And however you can use any of us in various ways to come along for support, help, encouragement, and most of all, to share in the hope that you provide for us, that you find us willing, ready, and able to do so. Lord, thank you for the influence of Mr. J this past week on our kids. Thank you for his talent and his gift and how he readily uses it for your kingdom work. And Lord, our, our, our kids are so excited. Uh, even those who saw all of VBS can't wait to go see a repeat at camp in just a couple of weeks. They had the chatters up. We've had another seven or eight sign up for, uh, for, for camp uh, to go hear Mr. J share the gospel again. We pray for, uh, for Mr. J as he starts a new week of VBS at another new home church in Gilroy. May they experience your blessings and your transformation. Father, for what we want to say and challenge us with today, may you find us receptive to what you want to communicate to our hearts. For the privilege of giving and sharing, we say thanks in the incredible name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I've had to go old school today because uh, I can't remember where I put my iPad when I left on vacation. <laughs> Uh, it's usually either on my desk or it's on my uh, nightstand charging up at home. And uh, when I got up to come this morning, it, uh, it wasn't on my nightstand. I figured, oh, it's on my desk, no problem. But I get down here and it's not on my desk. So I, uh, you know, there's a thing called Find My Phone, iPhone. Okay, you connect your iPad. So I did that this morning. Uh, I had to Google how to do it because I didn't know how to do it. Uh, and, and so it told me that my iPad was off and it couldn't find it. And, you know, okay, uh, I mean, probably the battery's dead and I'll never find it now. But sitting in the, during the last song, my phone went up and it said, found your iPad. Uh, it's at my house somewhere, uh, according to the address that's on there. So uh, I'll have to go find it. So we're using, we're using papers today, all right? So uh, I hope I don't get lost in, in paper. Uh, you know, it was several weeks ago, uh, at the beginning of a sermon, I showed you a little clip about the vacation we were going on. And I did that with the intent of comparing the excitement of going on vacation to the excitement of going to heaven. I showed you a video clip of some of the rapids we were going to ride and the scenes we were going to see. And, and I had great excitement in preparation of going on that trip. And the trip was everything and even more than I imagined that it would be. The flip side of that is I was also ready to come home. I was ready to be with people that I love, in an environment that I enjoy. There's something special about home. And as we were heading home, uh, and the guys in the van were so gracious, we, we actually, um, it seems like the river raft company counts seven days different than all of us counted seven days. It really was only six days, not really seven days. So all of us, we had our itinerary based on our view of seven days, not their view. So we found out that we were going to be leaving there a day earlier than we thought, so we were going to get home a day earlier than we thought. Uh, and then I found out that the family had planned a birthday dinner for Dad, because Dad turned 93 last Wednesday. And, uh, wow, you know what, I could get home in time for dinner. And so the guys were very gracious. This is kind of dead headed home uh, on Wednesday morning, not stop and eat as much as we did on the way to the trip. Um, it took us three days to get there because we ate our way out of California, <laughs> Nevada, Utah, and Arizona. All right? Uh, coming home, we, uh, we, we, we pretty much didn't eat. All right? And uh, got home with time for that. I uh, got home in time to see the last session of Vacation Bible School on Thursday. Um, but as, I was, as, as we were driving home, I was thinking, boy, the expectation of seeing something you've never seen before ought to be our attitude about heaven. Yeah. And then it also occurred to me, the trip home, and the expectation of coming home also ought to reflect our attitude of going to heaven.
Because heaven is the believer's home. It's our forever. The Bible describes it this way, in my Father's house. The Father's house is always home. If you're new to New Hope, we're in the midst of a series. We start at the beginning of the summer on what's up with heaven. Since it is our eternal home, it seems like we ought to know as much about it as we possibly can. And I think in knowing more about it, it alleviates many of our fears. Over the years, particularly working uh, a lot with hospice, I've discovered that it's not so much going to heaven that worries people, it's the process of getting there that has most of us concerned. It's the dying process that most of us aren't sure how we're going to handle. And I think that's where we find those words of David most encouraging when I walk through the valley. As I transition from temporary to eternal, as I navigate through the process of death that ultimately leads me to everlasting life, that is often where a lot of our concerns and our fears come from. So we've been doing our best to look at what does the Bible say about heaven. When I finished uh, three weeks ago, uh, we were talking about the myths that surround God in heaven. Let me just highlight those. By the way, these sermons are on the website, so they're usually posted within two or three days after Sunday. I understand we've had some complications recently with the phone app, uh, but the regular website is, is pretty uh, timely with it. But the phone app, we're having some struggles. They're going to get those figured out. You'll be able to get them there as well. So you can go back and re-listen or listen for the first time to any of these that may be of interest. But three weeks ago, we looked at the three popular myths about God and heaven. Myth number one, that God is a cosmic killjoy. That God just doesn't like to have fun. And hopefully we debunked that myth for you way back then. Uh, God is not boring. All you have to do is take a ride through the Grand Canyon on the Colorado River and discover that in what he created, he is not boring. Uh, myth number two, that heaven will be monotonous. Uh, heaven is not going to be monotonous. It's not sitting on a cloud, strumming the guitar. That's all that we're doing. God has so much more for us in heaven that it's not going to be monotonous. And the third myth that we attempted to debunk three weeks ago was that heaven will be one long church service. Oh, God, deliver us from that. Okay? Uh, that is not what heaven is going to be like. We also briefly talked about three weeks ago that there are two primary responsibilities in heaven. Do you remember what those were? Worship and work. And you guys, your memories are good. That was three weeks ago. Outstanding. Yeah. Two primary responsibilities that we'll get to enjoy are worship and work. Uh, exhilarating worship like you have never experienced before. The best worship service you've ever been in will pale in comparison to the kind of worship that we will get to participate in when we are in heaven. We know from many, many scriptures that worship is going to be a part of what we get to enjoy when we get into heaven. Just as uh, spectators at, at, at athletic events love to celebrate, you and I are going to love to celebrate in heaven. What I hope that you took out of that message about worship is that worship is the continual awareness of gratitude towards and submission to God in everything that we do. We should worship in our work as well as we work at our worship. I discovered that while floating on a uh, life-threatening craft going down the river, all right, in the, in the, in the Grand Canyon, can be an act of worship. I look at the beauty of what God has created. I had to laugh at times. Uh, remember, this was a vacation. And our river guides often tried to scientifically explain all the various layers of the Grand Canyon. How billions of years ago these catastrophic events occurred. And was, now, we don't know how this thing that should have taken place billions of years ago ended up in the middle layers. We don't, we don't, and quite frankly, they would say after this big, long explanation of how it took billions of years to get, then they would ultimately say, we really don't know how all this happened. <laughs> I just sat on my rubber tube and smiled. <laughs> and on occasions, 
around dinner discussions or in small groups, when the subject would come up again, I would say, guys, it wasn't very hard for God to do all of this. And you have to understand, what, when God created, he created it so that scientifically it would make sense. When he created Adam as a full-grown man, Adam, though he was only one day old, he was a full-grown man. Eve, though she was only one day old, when God said, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, she was a full-grown woman. One day old, but looked as a full-grown woman. When God spoke creation into existence, it was not going to defy science. It would define science. If you look at most of the major educational institutions in this country, if you go to the Ivy League schools, the first founding universities in this country, 90% of them were founded by churches and pastors for the purpose of the Christian community being able to, great, to at a greater degree, explain the science of this world. Who did archaeological studies turn to to ratify many of what they had found? They had to turn to the scriptures because it was the oldest recorded documents. So, in our pleasure, like riding down a raft, in our science, like trying to explain the Grand Canyon, there is worship. We must quit thinking that we can only worship God while doing nothing else. Rather, we should worship God while doing everything else. And then there's work. Some of you are saying, Tim, wait a minute, working in heaven? That sounds more like hell than heaven. The only reason that we went to the concept of working through eternity is because our labor in this world has been burdened by the effects of the curse of sin. Our bodies grow tired. Our relationships become strained. Government regulations are burdensome, and we have an environment that never cooperates with us. But in the new heaven and the new earth, all those effects will evaporate because there will no longer be the effects of a curse. And so those are the things that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. What I want to pick up today is a little more of what we're going to be doing in heaven. I recall a story that I read some time ago about a man who had to cross a wide river on the ice. He was afraid that the ice might be too thin, so he began to crawl on his hands and his knees always pushing ahead of him in great fear that he would break through the ice and drown. Just as he got within a few feet of the opposite shore, absolutely worn out and exhausted, another man comes gliding by him nonchalantly on a sled filled with iron. And he arrives with a big smile on his face and exhilarated. How like that exhausted man on the ice on his hands and knees are many Christians who are headed for heaven. They tremble at every step they take in this life, lest the divine promises break underneath their feet. Jesus calls us to rest in our worship and our work in this life, just like we will experience in our work and worship in the next. We can take his promises at face value, but they are strong enough to hold us up. We should not let fear paralyze and hinder us as we enjoy this life. If life in the Garden of Eden can serve as a small template for what we can expect in heaven, then we can look forward to the future of an eternity where we are engaged in cultivating and creating the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He created nature. And what did he call it? Good. He said it's good. But God intended for us, who are his image bearers, to continue to cultivate nature, to work in it, and to create something very good with what he had provided for us. For example, Terry, oranges are good, aren't they? You bet. Yeah, he sells a lot of citrus. Peaches are good, aren't they? But isn't peach cobbler very good? <laughs> Avocados are good, aren't they? They're having some trouble with them down there because of the weather they just had down south. I heard that on the news yesterday. All right? Avocados are good. The folks guacamole is very good. 
For some of you, tomatoes are really good. For others of us, not so good. But you chop up tomatoes and you put it with other spices and things and you make salsa. That is good, isn't it? And you put that with guacamole, it is really, really good. So when God created a man and placed him in the garden, he commissioned Adam to cultivate and keep what God had begun. But more than a cultivator, Adam was also to be a creator, which he demonstrated when he employed his imagination to name the animals as they came before him. The job description of cultivator and creator, I believe, are still a fact in today's world. Just look around us. The automobile, the airplane, the computer, the iPhone are examples of humankind's God-given creativity at work to make the world a more enjoyable place in which to live. We shouldn't be surprised that we will continue our creative work in the new heaven and the new earth. Why wouldn't we want to bake peach cobblers and eat salsa and write books and make movies and produce songs and teach classes and do a thousand things that we do on earth? Dr. Francis Schaeffer, one of my favorite authors back in the 70s, he said, the greatest creativity ever given is the ability of men and women by the choices they make to change the course of history. God gave man that creativity. That is a great dignity of humanity, the power to change the world. And that is what the church is here for. It is said about the first century church that they turned the world upside down as they preach the message of Jesus Christ's resurrection. Creativity is freedom to see things as fresh and new, to enter each dawn with a beginner's heart and a child-eyed wonder. If you want a clue about what your work might be in heaven, ask yourself the question that Bob Beale once posed to author Robert Jeffries. Bob asked Bob. You could call Robert Bob, right? So Bob asked Bob, if money and education were not a factor, and you could do anything in the world with the guarantee that you wouldn't fail, what would you do? Some of you might be saying, Tim, why is that a relevant question to this discussion? Because according to Paul's writings in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul wrote these words, God is at work in you, giving you the will and the power to achieve his purpose. So what would you do? See, God is the one who plants the will, the desire to accomplish his purpose for our lives in this world. One of the best indicators of what we should be doing in this life and what we will be doing in the next life is based on desires God has placed in our hearts. The question is, are we given into our own personal desires, or have we come to a point where we submit to the desires that God has given to us? I will strongly suggest to you this morning that God does not waste gifts. God does not waste experiences. God, God does not waste desires on us. They are all essential components for the purpose of our unique life, not just in this life, but in the life to come as well. Remember, our lives are each a continuum that begins on earth and it extends beyond the grave. Who we are on this earth is who we will be in heaven. Perfected, of course. But guys, the Tim McLean Roland that you see right now, I will be Tim McLean Roland in heaven. I know that's a disappointment. <laughs> but it's a fact. The Bible says we will be known as we are known. Perfected. But we don't become somebody else when we die with different interests and gifts and skills and responsibilities or callings. Therefore, we can assume that our work on the new earth will in some way connect, maybe even resemble the work God has called us to on this present earth. Hey, some of you uh, panhandlers, is that what you're, what, what you're, what's your group called? Porch dogs. What? Porch dogs? Wasn't there another group called panhandlers or pan... Dragons. Pan dragons. Yeah, pan dragons. Hey, you may be preparing incredible vehicles for us to go down the golden streets of heaven. All right? But God doesn't give us interest and gifts and one thing just to destroy them in heaven. I don't fully understand how it all will work, but God will not waste it. Besides cultivating and creating, Adam and Eve 
We're also challenged to rule and reign as God's co-regents over creation. They were to be the king and queen of earth. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. The weird thing about that is the man who is to be over every creeping thing has sometimes become the biggest creeps on earth. But Adam and Eve's conscious decision to rebel against God forced them to abdicate their reign over creation. In the book of Romans, Paul says, in time, God sent to the world a second Adam. I'll get a little theological here, so hang with me for a moment. Who was the first Adam? Adam of creation. All right? First man ever created. Genesis chapter 2. After God created the heavens and the earth, on the sixth day, he created man. That man's name was Adam. Paul, in the book of Romans, that tells us in the New Testament that at the appointed time, God sent a second Adam. Who was the second Adam? Jesus Christ. The first Adam of creation was the first perfect man ever created. Created perfect. Jesus Christ, the second Adam, was the first man ever born perfect. Born of a woman, Mary, the Christmas story. Who was Jesus' father? God. Not Joseph. Joseph was the adopted earthly father. But the one who planted the seed in the womb of Mary was God the Father through the person of the Holy Spirit. And God the Son, the Lord Jesus, 33 years who lived, lived 33 years, was birthed by Mary. Perfect. One side note, I alluded to this a couple of times in the past, but let me review it for you again. Men, since Jesus was born perfect, where does humanity's sin nature come from? It comes from us as the men. That doesn't mean your wife is perfect. Okay? <laughs> Some of you said close. <laughs> but the sin nature is passed from one generation to the next through us men. Otherwise, Jesus could not have been born perfect and be born more. So, first Adam, second Adam is Jesus Christ. Okay? Who was the first Eve? Eve. When God looked at Adam and saw that it wasn't good for him to be alone, he created Eve. Who's the second Eve? Say that louder. The church. The church is the image of the second Eve. Jesus is called the bridegroom. The church is called what? The bride, just as Adam and Eve were the bride and the bridegroom of creation. Now Christ and the church, we are the bride and bridegroom of this kingdom work of God on earth. It is through the message of Jesus Christ that the church preaches that God's family grows. When this happens, you and I are fulfilling the role of God that he originally assigned in Adam and Eve on the old earth in Revelation 22, 5 says, we, the bride, will reign with Christ, the bridegroom, forever and ever. And what is the extent of our reign? Who gets to rule and reign? I think we have our best insight. I don't have a perfect answer for you on this, but I think we have our best insight in the last parable that Jesus told before his arrest. It's found in Luke chapter 19. If you want to turn there, or I'm just going to read it to you. It's found in Luke chapter 19, right in the middle of the chapter. What happens immediately after Jesus tells this story is what you and I know is the beginning of the Easter story. It's the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Not that any one passage in the Bible is more important than another, 
But it does seem to me that this is the last thing that he tells. It ought to be pretty significant to us. It has some pretty strong influence. Here's the story. A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. Who's that sound like? Anytime the preacher asks a question in church, what usually is the answer? Jesus. Yes. Okay. A man of noble birth, Jesus, okay, God is his father, went to a distant country, left heaven, came to earth to have himself appointed king and then to return. As he came, though a king he was, he came as a servant. Okay, so that he could convey the love of God to us, but he was indeed king. So he called ten of his servants, and he gave them ten minas. These are not birds. Okay? A mina was a, a, a weight of gold. Okay? And so he gave them ten minas. He put this money to work, and he said, until I come back. But the subject hated him, and they sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. Isn't that exactly what the Pharisees were going to do the next week? <laughs> They were going to go yell to Herod, No, oh, he's not king of the Jews. Don't put that, don't put that on him. Don't do that. He's not our king. Verse 15. He was made king, however, returned home. And then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Ten more. Well done, my good servant, Master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mind has earned five more. The Master said, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I kept it and I laid it away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you. Didn't know it very well, did he? Because you were a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Then why didn't you put my money on deposit so when I came back I could have collected it with interest? And then he said to those standing by, take his mind away from him and give it to the one who has ten. And, Sir, they said he already has ten. He replied, I tell you, to everyone who has, more will be given. But as it is for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be keen over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Pretty serious business, huh? In Jesus' story, the first servant reported a thousand percent return on the investment, earning the nobleman's praise, well done. You've been faithful with a little I will give you much authority over 10 cities. The second servant reported a 500% return, was given authority over five. But a third servant wasn't nearly as industrious. Instead of investing wisely, he hid the mind of fearing recrimination from the master. Why did you not put my money in the bank and then I could have collected interest? His master had given his third servant one and returned exactly what he had been given. You see, his mistake was failing to leverage what had been entrusted to him. Remember, the mina represents all that God has entrusted to us during our brief stay on earth. Everything we have, our time, our money, our gifts, our opportunities, they are simply on loan to us from God to use to expand his influence of the kingdom. But here's the paradox. Although our existence on earth, according to verse 17, is a little thing compared to eternity, we have the opportunity to leverage the value of our lives on earth by investing into the expansion of God's kingdom. Our ability and willingness to make such an investment will determine our responsibilities in heaven when Christ comes for us. Unfortunately, the third servant failed to wisely invest. He received the nobleman's condemnation instead of his condemnation. And what had been given to the third had been taken away and given to the first. God has placed within our hands not only a precious treasure, our life, but also a great purpose and responsibility to use our limited time and treasure in this life to further God's agenda, not our own. Now what does ruling and reigning look like in heaven? I have no idea. I have no idea what that's going to look like for us. But this story that he tells right before 
his arrest. The beginning of Easter week. Right after, if we were to read the next few verses, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, Hey, go into the city. You're going to find a young colt tied up to a tree. Go bring it to me. I'm going to ride that unridden colt. And if the master, if the owner, says, Hey, who wants my horse? Who wants my donkey? Who wants my young colt? Tell him the master needs it. Did that happen? It did. The guy who owned the young colt came out and said, Hey, what are you doing with my animal? And they said, The master needs it. What did he say? Take it. He put his mind on good use, didn't he? It was just a young, unridden, untrained colt, not worth a whole lot yet. Because the master wanted it. You and I have never forgotten the story of the young colt and the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We've never forgotten. He accomplished the purpose God intended for him. I don't know what the reign of the owner of that young colt will be like in heaven, but I know it will be far different than it would have been if he said, no, you can't have my colt. I don't know what it's going to exactly look like and play out like in my own head, but I know not to do it is disastrous. Let me wrap this up. I can do this quickly. Three permanent perks of heaven. Besides worship and work, you and I will get to enjoy other believers. We were made for community. We were made to be together. When, when I would call home and I'd talk to Shelly, Shelly would say, y'all still getting along in the van? <laughs> yeah, man, we you know, sometimes too many people in the van, you can get on each other's nerves. Say, Terry, you didn't get on my nerves, did I get on your Don't answer that out loud. <laughs> We, we had people at, at, at camp on, on two of the nights particularly, and, and especially the last night. People were coming to our camp to find out where all the fun was going. We were just cracking up. I can't tell you why we were laughing. But we were laughing. It was hilarious. We, we just had a grand time. Well, we're made for community. And people who would kind of isolate themselves, but they would hear the laughter of community, they were drawn to it. So in heaven, we're going to get to enjoy community. Just imagine how fascinating it would be to walk with Adam in heaven and say, hey, what was the garden of Eden like before you screwed it up? <laughs> we're going to say, no, no, man, what was it like being on the boat for so many months? Man, what was it like to rain cats and dogs 40 days and 40 nights? We'll be able to sit down with Abraham as Abraham. What was going through your mind and heart when you pulled the knife back? And you were about ready to take your son's life. God stopped your hand. What was that like? We'll get to sit down and talk to some of the, the crowd that was part of the children of Israel leaving Egypt and say, hey, what did you think when you crossed the river on dry ground and you turned around and looked and all of Pharaoh's army was white? What was that like? We'll get to hear David retell the story of, of whipping Goliath when he was just a young boy. We'll get to hear the surprising discovery firsthand followers of Jesus of what it was like to go to the tomb on Easter morning and find it empty. We'll get to talk theology and understand theology with Augustine and Jerome and Martin Luther and Calvin and, Ar and, and Arminius. We'll get to talk science with Pascal and Newton and, and Carver. We will discuss courage with Wilberforce and Martin Luther King Jr. We'll find out what it was like to compose the most famous hymn of the church from the lips of John Newton himself as he wrote Amazing Grace. We'll get to ask the authors like G.K. Chesterton and Tolkien and Lewis, well, what were you thinking when you came up with those images? We'll learn what it was like to preach before thousands from Moody and Graham. From our first day and every day after that, we will walk the streets. And we'll say, hey, there goes E. That's a 10, guys. That's a 10. <laughs> you better take your autograph book with you. Because, man, you're just going to keep running into Caleb and Solomon and the Apostle John, <coughs> Esther, Ruth. We'll also get to learn more about God. I don't think when we get to heaven, we know everything right away. We're not God. We are in His image. We will be perfected. Here's what I do know is, I won't forget your name ever again when I get to heaven. <laughs> what I learn about God, I won't forget. I will remember, but it will be this ongoing discovery of who He is. The last <laughs> part, we will experience real rest. Real rest. Most of us know what it's like to live in the tyranny of the urgent. 
pressure of life at every moment. In the river, all you thought about was whether you were hot or cold and needed to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Not much else. We couldn't get to a phone to find out what was going on in the outside world. We couldn't tell the outside world what was going on with us. It was just morning to evening. Eat, sleep, and be merry. Rest. And heaven is going to even be better than that. We'll be released from the tiresome threats and the ridicule of living a godly life in a godless world. We'll be able to not be in a hurry for anything. But I want you to understand the rest of heaven is not just being relieved of the pressures of hostility and pressure and persecution. I think the rest that God offers to us through Jesus Christ both now and in heaven is, is to be understood in the context of this momentary respite from the work that allows us to savor the satisfaction of a job well done. When God created in six days, and the scripture says he rested on the seventh, did God rest because he was tired? He rested to enjoy, to observe, to appreciate. It is a cessation from labor that allows us to reflect upon what we have accomplished and to say, this is good. This is very good. I'm sure that Mark and Jennifer would have enjoyed a little more time because they finished Friday night late putting everything back. BBS. See, part of the model around New Hope Church is the ministry is not finished until the cleanup is done. And then they had to pack and drive to San Francisco to go to England. I'm, I, I'm, I'm convinced they would have loved a few more days to have looked back at BBS week and say, this was good. This was very good. I think it's a kind of rest that reminds us that as important as our work will be, even in heaven, that there will be other aspects of life that are to be enjoyed as well, not the least of which include perfect relationships with others and with God that we've always longed for. Here's what I want to close with. You don't have to wait for heaven to start resting in Jesus. That's not just a future hope. It can be a present reality. Jesus offered to us and to his disciples a rest to our soul. The relieving of the burdens and the pressure. He says, bring them to me. Lay them on me. My shoulders are big enough. Yours are burdened down. Give them to me. Leave them with me. Don't take them back with you. And isn't that what we have been doing? We take our burdens to the Lord, and then we walk away with them. He says, well, well wait, just, just leave those here. Oh, oh no, I don't want to keep your house a mess. And I can handle this with God. Jesus wants us to begin to learn now what it's like to, to leave, to shrug away, to shrug off the weight of our sin, the consequence of our past, the worry of tomorrow, and the fear of dying. He says, leave all those in my place. Find rest for your life. Let's not wait to heaven to begin to rest. If you've never invited Christ in your life, there's no special formula. There's not a certain set of words you have to say. But it does require an honest confession in your heart. Something like this, Lord Jesus, I don't know everything there is to know about you. I've probably forgotten more than I can ever learn to remember. But you are the one who without work without credentials, without earning anything. You offer to me love, forgiveness, and life. I'm ready to receive that today. I'm ready to acknowledge my sin. I'm ready to acknowledge my selfishness. I'm ready to acknowledge I like the throne, but I'm not very good at it. So I'm ready for you to come live within my life. I'll be excited to learn more about what a relationship with you is like as the days go by. But I need rest for my soul. Come to me.
You can pray that prayer right here, right now. You can do it on your way home. You can do it after you get home. You can do it next week. It's never too late until you die. And then it is too late. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the incredible promises of the future that you give to us. But Father, thank you in the midst of those future promises, you have some very present realities for us. We can begin to experience rest because we've been forgiven. We can begin to experience rest because what you ask of us, you are willing to provide for us. Father, thank you that the community of believers is a, a small taste of what forever heaven is going to be like. Thank you that the, the purpose of our work on earth is not going to be wasted and just buried with our bodies in a grave, but Father, they're going to go with us. We will be in heaven who we are here, just better versions of ourselves because you get to finish your work in us. Thank you for the hope that heaven extends to us. May we grasp it. And for those of us who are here today and are believers, Father, may we ask ourselves the question, <coughs> God, if you have given to us the purpose, the desire, and the will to accomplish your plans in our lives, what would we do? And may we let you do it in us. May we not stand in the way of what you want to do to expand your kingdom's influence while we are living on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.